Dear friends, I am very much delighted to welcome all of you for this exciting series of online webinars on the theme, Wider Contextual Biblical Hermeneutics, jointly organized by Ecumenical Christian Center and it's a collaboration with Church of South India. Today we are going to have a 19th lecture on the most dynamic and fascinating theme, the message of the letters to the Hebrews by an amazing intellectual scholar and a brilliant theologian by name, Dr. Supong Mayang Longkumar. At present, Dr. Supong Mayang Longkumar serves as an associate professor of the New Testament studies. He also serves as an academic dean in the SIBS, South India Biblical Seminary, Bangarpet in Karnataka state. Dr. Supong Mayang Longkumar had written number of scholarly articles. In fact, he also authored number of books, especially The Apocalypse of John and its Subalterns, Implications for Post-Colonial Tribal Context, and uh, The New World, a sociological approach to revolution or cutting edge in the field of biblical, sociological, and contextual theologies. Along with all of you, I myself tremendously curious to listen to this important subject, the message of the letter to the Hebrews from the young and intellectual mind, Dr. Supong Mayang Longkumar. Dr. Supong Mayang Longkumar, we're extremely fortunate to have you with us. Therefore, I hand over this time to Dr. Supong Mayang Longkumar. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator, sir. Uh, good evening uh, to everyone and to people who are out of country. I think timing will be different, but from Bangalore, uh, good evening. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, take this as a noble opportunity, a privilege um, where um, I could be a part of this uh, a vibrant uh, theological um, discourses and then along with the course that is undertaking. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, Dr. Matthew, uh, the director of ECC, um, Dr. Johnson, the professor of uh, at U UPS, Mr. Tang Minlun, VP, deputy director of ECC, and Re Reverend Sugumar Bapu, uh, program executive, the present uh, moderator for this evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this privilege to be a part of this um, wonderful program. Uh, before we go into the uh, the talk on this very um, let's say a very skeptical and dangerous and trap you know some aspect of that before we enter to that well, we will look to God in prayer first and seek God's guidance for this evening let's pray Dear Jesus, we acknowledge the very moment that you have blessed to each and every one of us. At this moment, as we enter into another book in the New Testament, and as we seek and explore the knowledge, the wisdom, and the lessons that you want us to throw, it is my humble prayer that the one who speaks and listens and discuss will all be placed through your spirit alone because it is the same God who has spoken to the first generation believers. It is the same God who is right now with us and it will be the same God who will look forward to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me share the screen. <clears throat> 
the message of the letter to the Hebrews. Inception. One of the brilliant and exquisite composition of the New Testament is the letter to the Hebrews. Though there are circumstances around its composition in terms of authorship, audience, date, and others, it reserves a prominent place in the New Testament. At the same time, Hebrews cannot be identified to any New Testament churches or linked to literary to other books, yet writings echoes are quite visible. Exposing the 12 nature of Jesus as divine and human in both Christological and soteriological aspect will indeed throw light to the message of Hebrews that we are trying to look into this evening. Therefore, to grasp the message of the letter, it is important to have imaginative nature so that one can situate into authors' anxieties towards the readers of this first century text. The author's conviction with Christ, the apostolic faith, pastoral zeal, and humanness also need to be incorporated while exploring the text. Well, this presentation will incorporate through a descriptive approach as a hermeneutical tool for it will expose the theological motives or in other words, message describing Christological and soteriological dimension of the text. Now picking notable backgrounds, if the correlation setting of the author and readers are important to the New Testament inter interpreters, then the letter of the Hebrews is placed in a very difficult task. The letter notably raises several problems about its authorship, date, and audience which led towards advancing hypothesis according um, adding conflicting scholarship in the process of understanding the text. Nonetheless, this section will highlight some of those prevailing issues in understanding the upbringing of Hebrews, including its literary aspect. First, authorship. A very difficult question is placed when the authorship of Hebrews is considered. From an external testimony, one can lens into the earliest tradition where Clement of Alexandria acknowledged that the letter was written by Paul in Hebrew language and was translated by Luke into Greek. Oricon was clear that the thoughts were of Pauline, yet did not accept its language and thereby concluded by saying, but who wrote the epistle, God only knows certainly. I think this is a very famous a quotation that continues to challenge our, the New Testament scholarship. Hippoplitus <clears throat> um, Hip, Hippo and Irenaeus in the West, that's in Italy and uh, Western Europe, did not attribute to Paul as the author. North Africa, where Roman traditions were followed, but did not regard as Paul's. While at Gardage, Tritulian credited it to Parnabas. And by the fourth century, in the Eastern traditions, Augustine and Jerome influences crew where Paul is ascribed as the author. During the Middle Ages, these questions hardly were on the talk until the Reformation period arrived, by casting doubt again on Paul's authorship. Because for Luther, it was Apollos, whereas later, Calvin brought back the earlier theory of Luke being the author or even Clement of, uh, Clement of Rome. Well, today there are comparatively few who maintain Paul's authorship or else it is, a rare, it is rarely defended. Some reasons include literary style, theological emphasis, and especially the author's claim in chapter two, verse three, to have been evangelized by an earlier generation of believers. In modern times, for instance, Gerald C. Dory proposes that the author be evangelist Priscilla, the husband of um, Aquila, who along with her husband lived in Rome once. He argued that the author was suppressed since she was a woman 
and was in a context where women ought not to be given prominence in the church. The modern scholarship has also suggested, but it is reluctant to identify with any of the New Testament names. Nevertheless, it is evident that the author was quite fluent in Greek and familiar with the Septuagint with rhetorical expressions on the text and finding spaces for spiritual insights towards Christian faith. Data. There requires strong data or convincing evidence to conclude that the date for this in order to, uh, is another problem in the letter. Persons like it, Abby Proust supported the view that the letter was written before the fall of Jerusalem based on the present tense used in the text, like in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And this is to say that when the letter was composed, the Jewish priestly practices and rituals of the temple were carrying on. Several dissents emerged based on this view. One thing uh, that we have to remember is there are different scholars that have viewed on uh, either before or post 70 CE. And those people who, uh, the scholars that supports uh, the 70 CE includes uh, P. Lentras, uh, W. L. Lane, Donnell Guthrie, uh, P. E. Hux, uh, F. T. Moll, F. F. Proust, and others. And those scholars who support to the view of uh, post 70 CE includes W.G. Comel, H. Quester, uh, M. E. Isaac, R. H. Fuller, and others. So there is a huge, uh, there are lots of uh, debates that continue to wrestle on. For instance, from here on, H. Von Sutton views the view was uh, that the letter was addressed to Gentiles, the Gentile Christians, and not Hebrews, and the temple was already fallen. Of course, the Levitical service of the Old Testament is reflected in the letter about the Jewish order and priestly functions. <clears throat> Though it cannot be certain about whether the fall of Jerusalem or the temple has taken place or not, that is, you know, 70 CE, when this letter was composed. However, there is a possible date that can be as certain, that is, around 96 CE. Uh, during the embarrassment of Domitian and attributed to Clement of Rome because Clement of Rome uh, has used the source or quoted the sources frequently uh, during 95 and 96 CE. Now there is internal evidence where a few interactions direct towards the recipients belong to second Christian generation and including new converts. And those are the clues that considers that the date is later um, to post 70 CE. Now the audience, to whom did the anonymous author write to is another problem of the letter. It seems the converts were social, uh, socializing into a new community who were taught by the author about the basic elements of the oracles of God or the basic teachings about Christ. The identity and situation can be drawn further through the windows of passages. For instance, Hebrew chapter two verses one to four deals with the conversion of people in response to their encounter with the gospel. And Hebrews chapter 13, 10, 13 and so on reveals that the community members were capable of doing charitable works and being hospitable. Now Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 symbolically indicates new identity as a purity as they baptize and join the new community and so on. So this would suggest that the audience of Hebrews belongs to three options. First, Gentiles, Gentile Christians, Jewish Christians living in Israel, that's Jerusalem, and Jewish Christians in diaspora, that is the Hellenistic Jews. First, internal evidence like Hebrews chapter six Chapter 13, such as of a general audience using uh, Greek applying the Septuagen. The use of all the statement for the general community of that time is quite common. And yet the usage of 
leading figures like Moses priesthood, prophets, rituals, and angels may not suit in the general audience. So that's a doubt. Second, the audience could be Israelite Jews and Jerusalem being the, center, uh, the central. The Old Testament themes like priests, ritual, sacrifices, and overtone of Jerusalem suggest of this audience. Yet if they belong to the Israelite audience, then the language of the letter should have been appropriate um, to be in Aramaic. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 also mentions that the audience were of second generation believers, which cannot be true to the context of people living in Jerusalem. The third is the Hellenistic Jews living in diaspora, being the recipients of the letter. Based on the knowledge of the Old Testament and Levitical rituals, and especially the internal evidence that we have referenced in chapter two, verse three, chapter 13, verse 24, there is a strong support of this view that the audience <clears throat> was residing in Rome, that's in Italy, rather than Palestine. And that, that chapter 13, verse 24 is a strong evidence. <clears throat> and nevertheless, one of the crucial things for the uh, reason to write the letter is because of the fear that the group of Jewish converts is in danger of a relapse into Judaism, that is returning back to Judaism. There is a sense of where they have abandoned their <clears throat> traditional temple worship and ceremonies that uphold their past. In this line of thought, the objective of the author was to let the Christian remain in the church, confessing Christian faith, which we have reference on that. <clears throat> the literary aspect. To understand a piece of literature, it becomes imperative to identify its literary genre. Hebrews can be read in and interpreted to determine its genre. As such, Hebrew genre is consisting of a governing literature as a letter, as a Christological treatise, or say a theological treatise, and as a sermon. First, it is a governing literature based on its placement within the New Testament, a new governing founded by Jesus. When Hebrews is taken into account as a literature about the knowledge where God and human relationship is unveiled, then readers may engage in understanding one's ideological standpoint rather than discovering the text's ideological implications. In this way, it is <clears throat> more associated with didactic and a propagandistic literature where the communication is more on confirmation of its significant values that are mostly known to people already. In other words, it is not about articulating uh, certain meanings of the text, but situate to the reader's situation through the meaning. Second, Hebrew is placed within the collection of letters and the author was a Christian leader <clears throat> who was personally known to the community or the, the church as it indicates about the author's revisit very soon, which we find in chapter 13, 19 through 23. The believers were of second generation Christians as we have noted and as such, they did not witness Jesus' events, but responded to the proclamations or the preaching of those who have heard or those who have witnessed about Jesus. The earliest leaders who preached were diseased and like they were no more. And in this context, the author reminds the congregation to pay a great attention to the original message of their former leaders to discard what has been preached to them was their damnation. Yet the author encouraged them based on the earlier courage they portrayed during difficult times to enact in the present. So this text refers about those aspects. Third, Hebrew for a reader is more of a theological treatise or 
Christological thread is where biblical exposition is made clear to describe Christology. Declaration of Christ is superior to angels. Christ is eternal son. Christ as the high priest and others are brought through scripture quotations. We will be elaborating a little bit later on, on that. <clears throat> the author incorporated various lit uh, literary and historical contexts to relate through the scene where the people of God of its time is complemented to the Israel of the Old Testament and the end times. The scripture is not only about God speaking in the past alone, but speaks about Christ who has come and the message speaks to the generation of today and so also the days to come, which in reference to Psalm 95 and comparing with Jeremiah chapter 31. The fourth literary aspect, Hebrew is seen as a sermon. The reader today recapitulate the ancient text and view of uh, as a sermon based on the form and content. The sermon patterns include exemplar, conclusion, and exhortation. For example, Hebrews chapter one, verses one to four is an introduction. Exemplar, which scripture passage is from verses five to 13. And verse 14 provides the conclusion and comes the exhortation in chapter two, verse one. There's also a form where classical rhetoric and synagogue practice is visible in Hebrews chapter three, verses um, one through chapter four, verse 14, where we can find the four aspects, introduction, citation, ex uh, expository, and conclusion. Therefore, through this literary genre, it is evident that Hebrews' intention of the author and the reader's perception is complete when the message is revealed and the hearers listen and respond to it in action. So these are four uh, literary uh, sources that we can throw. <clears throat> now coming to the second point, the theological message of the letter to the Hebrews. To begin this discourse, one can feel the nerves of the rhetorical powers of the first, uh, in the first chapter itself. For instance, there is an ambiguous interest of self-disclosure of God, which is quite audible. Then presenting Jesus as the culmination of the prophetic revelation and raised to the rank of divine sonship above angels and everyone, and is enormously impressive. Now there is a sense of allusions about the memorable and uh, inspiring statements between the all sacrifices and then the permanent efficiency while considering the date of Jesus. <clears throat> Thus, Christology and Soteriology become crucial in trying to understand Hebrews' message. Thereby, the description of these two themes will be explored first in a nutshell, and from within these will throw light towards its theological message. First, Christology. The author of Hebrew brings to light the title Christ and occasionally Jesus Christ, which is used at the same time. The usage of the name is to show Christ superior to any P. <clears throat> Christ is called, uh, Christ, uh, we, we will find that Christ has been used 12 times in Hebrews. And then in the latter part, this is inclined towards uh, when it comes to Jesus Christ as confirming to the Son of God that declares Christ is resembling to the Messiah or uh, which has its own connotation on this respect. Now, Christ is expressed for both the agent of creation and sustainer that we find in chapter 1, verse 3. Well, Christ is projected as greater, uh, greater than prophets of the Old Testament, including Moses, the giver of law. Christ is superior than angels and Levitical priesthood and surpasses the priesthood of Aaron. Christ being the perfect sacrifice. 
for the description of fate and faithfulness also covers the Christological uh, expression employing exhortation among others. <clears throat> Under this, we would like to draw two aspects. First is the son of God, superior to angels. Under this, Hebrew does not reveal the name Jesus in the beginning, but identifies as son, which without doubt is the son of God. The familial relationship between God and son is made visible here. On the other hand, there's also no philosophical or speculative ideas or definition of God. How God is understood by Jews is taken for granted. Remember at one point of time, God says that I am who I am. As such, God in the past has spoken to people through prophets in various ways, whereas God spoke through a son in these last days. The son is the reflection of God's glory and the imprint of God. The son sustains all things, the son purifies sins, and the son is superior to angels. And that is forming the aspect, the Christological aspect of uh, the Christological fam uh, familial uh, aspect of God, which in reference to the Son of God. Then follows with scriptural quotations to confirm what has been introduced about the Son. For instance, Nadan's oracle of David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, is proud to confirm, I will be his father and he will be my son in Hebrews chapter 1, 5. So this is, you know, bringing the quotations from the Old Testament. Another is the Paulus quotation that we find, uh, Paulus quotations that come around is in Psalm 45 and 102. These are made uttering in Hebrews chapter 1, 8 and 9. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. This is how the author of Hebrew reflects Christology right at the beginning itself. Consequently, Hebrew reminds and exhorts its audience that the community was standing in an eschatological moment where they have to give greater attention to what has been heard about God's word that is talking about the gospel. The Christian community has experienced suffering in the past, which we have already highlighted earlier as well. And so here, and the author reminds them about the danger of falling away from the message. Message here refers to the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. Not here, the warning where every transgression and obedience receives just penalty. In chapter two, verse three, possibly not immediately, immediately, but later is a must. That is what the author wants to convince to the audience. Um, and in certain uh, places, we will find that there is a transaction taking place that uh, because it has not gone into the dead, that is why they are still in that stage uh, where they can turn back and, you know, build up their faith in God. So that uh, situation comes in the later part, which to give a note when we reflect on this chapter 2, verse 3. And then, will the audience, after receiving this uh, gospel, after receiving the warnings, will the audience negate salvation by drifting away? Now, this suggests that the audience were assumed to be struggling to break free from their ancestral tradition, perhaps, for example, due to psychological attraction to the Levitical rites for dealing with sin. Or they are tempted to return to the safety of illicit traditional religion because of the experience of anti-Christian persecution, which was quite prominent in the early uh, first, uh, in the first century. The author thus calls the audience to maintain the message the gospel so that salvation is not negated 
which has been brought through Christ and witnessed by those who heard him. The second aspect, the son of God, lower than angels. The second exposition of Christological theme is found in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 18, where son's attention is drawn to abasement. The quotation is taken from Psalm 8, verse 4 to 6, <clears throat> where humanity will be crowned with glory and honor. Among all humans, only one has attained. And Hebrew confirms in chapter 2, verse 9, Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than angels, now crowned with glory and honor. This is to say that human race is lower in the order of creation than the angels. But, you know, this time to be crowned with glory and honor, which Jesus have taken as an example and being the role model, the forerunner of that. The author expresses the idea that humanity will pass through drop to attain the call for the son is the pioneer of their salvation. The son who shared as one among human calls them brothers and sisters now. And this is where Hebrew states the reason why the son has to undergo abasement to free humanity from the power of death of the son becomes a merciful and faithful high priest to adorn people from sin. Consequently, Hebrews exhorts its audience to consider the faithfulness of the son and introduce the high priest, the son of God who is without sin from whom to receive mercy and find grace. Chapter four. The author explicitly declares about a son as a faithful and finally brings the name Jesus into the picture. Now the warning that calls to enter God's rest as found in, from chapter three, seven to four, 13, takes place where the author introduces the failures of the generation that did not enter the promised land due to their unbelief. People witness the work of God but they still went astray. And this is to say that the wilderness generation did not enter because of unbelief, chapter three, verse nine. So also the Christians, though experience the divine act, will not enter the rest, chapter three, 11, compared with four, nine, 10. The cautions were presented from the past and unpack to the other generation because it was due to the lack of unity of faith and hearing as well. Second aspect point is the soteriology, the salvation act. The soteriological aspect in Hebrew begins from God revealing salvation through the son in chapter three, one and three, one to three. The confirmation of Jesus being the means of salvation has been witnessed by the author and audience through hearing and with eyewitness. The proclamation of the good news about salvation has been witnessed through the signs and miracles from the Holy Spirit in chapter two, verse four, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The human needs, the human need for salvation is alluding from the Old Testament understanding of sin that requires adornment. The author approaches to comprehend that the Old Testament, uh, all governance cannot suffice in dealing with sin. No animal sacrifices can deal permanently with sin and requires ceaseless sacrifice to deal with human sin. Believers under the old covenant received and lived by God's promise. Now believers in Christ receive salvation in Christ through the grace of God. The identification of Jesus being in human nature is identified with human beings through the incarnation. 
And this is to say that Jesus became human to experience humanness and go through date to acclaim adornment for sin in chapter 2, verse 9. As a result, the son is made perfect through sacrifice and became faithful and merciful high priest. Therefore, since Jesus experienced human weakness and temptation as a human, he was uh, he can sympathize with humanity now. He helps those who are tempted and he intercedes for them. And Jesus also takes hold of humanity and helps lead them to glory. Within this, let's study on this first two aspects. First is the priesthood of Melchizedek. Having discussed the necessity for the son to suit in human form as a faithful and merciful high priest, he brought exposition or redemption work is provided. According to Mosaic law, a priest should belong to a tribe of Levi, which Jesus was not one among. For the author to explain and convince the audience, the author reminds how a person ought to be called by God as Aaron. In chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. Throwing from Psalm number 110, verse 4. <clears throat> you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Jesus is qualified for the high priest, for he was called by God. That is the key point. Jesus is qualified for the high priest, for he is called by God. However, to relate with Melchizedek, it has to recount the story of Genesis chapter 14, verses 70 through 20, where Abraham, Abraham made tithes to Melchizedek. Abraham, being the ancestor of Levi, and Levi himself made tithes to Melchizedek through Abraham. So that's the connection that uh, makes, you know, qualifying and convince the audience. On the other hand, um, in the order of Melchizedek, it requires only one high priest who is perfect forever. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 28. Now, Jesus was fitting for a high priest for these reasons. Because Jesus was holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Chapter 7, verse 26. Consequently, Hebrews exhorts its audience to go beyond the basic teachings about Christ. Since they were not growing into maturity and provide hope, metaphorically, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain. The point is, uh, the, the author want to convince them that they need to go beyond their 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 conviction that they have or beyond the situation that they were undergoing because they were not growing in maturity, uh, maturity on this. Now the author identifies that the community needs to be more advanced in faith and not the way as they are at that moment. In other words, not to remain in that initial stage of belief. Initial stage in a sense, conversion takes place and that fate. So there is a danger of falling away. There's a danger of falling away, even after testing the authentic experience with God, and for which it is impossible to restore again to repentance. The point is, Jesus have sacrificed, and Jesus is not going to sacrifice again, so, which will be elaborated in the next point. So that's the point. It is impossible to restore again to repentance. That because there, um, the reason is, they would demonstrate contempt for the Son of God by crucifying him for their own account. Now, seeing that the audience has not reached such situation, that means to be condemned, thereby, 
the author exhorts to be diligent as they were till the end. How the diligent they are, how the, how they have uh, in overcome in the past till the end by being imitators of those who have endured true faith. That is the response exhortation that uh, the author provides. Second, the priestly work of the son. <clears throat> what is the nature of Jesus' priestly work? What is the nature of Jesus' priestly work? In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5 through 6, the author compares the affairs, Jesus' excellent ministry, a better government, a better promise. In other words, due to the offering of sons on blood, on life, a new and a better governance entered the heavenly sanctuary. While dealing with adornment, as stated in Leviticus chapter 16, where only the high priest enters the holy of holies, that means into the tabernacle, with the blood of animals, and that is also once a year, to adorn sin for the priest himself and also for the people. The ritual could not effectively deal with sin as the author um, testifies in chapter nine, verse nine through nine and 10. This is where son's priestly work is introduced. Jesus as the high priest offers his own blood and enders once for all into the holy place. Now for this reason, the son became the mediator of the new covenant. The Greek word, ditatke, uh, meaning will or even is considered as covenant. And according to Hebrews, this will will be affected when the person who met it dies. So that the new covenant is inaugurated. And that is where we find that Christ did that. On the other hand, since Jesus is the high priest, entered the heavenly sanctuary through death, so there was no need for further sacrifice again and again. Moreover, the sacrifice was once and for all, for all humanity. Chapter 10, verse 8 to 10. After all, God appointed the high priest through an oath. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. That is an oath that confirms, that differs from Aaron's call with Jesus. Consequently, Hebrews exhorts its audience about the examples of faith through various persons and deriving through Jesus' faith as we, have, we can find in chapter 11 to chapter 12, 13, the various uh, faith figures. Now reminding that the warnings and consequences when God's grace is rejected. After all these examples, warning still comes if God's grace is rejected. And a final reminder about Jesus' sacrifice to attain the city that is coming. As such, since the one who promises is faithful, we have to enter the sanctuary with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Chapter 10, 22. The author reminds of the horror of intentional sin, which we find in chapter 10, verse 2. We will fully persist to sin after having received the knowledge of the truth. And this is where an exhortation is met before you fall into the depth, you know, before they fall into the depths to recall their spiritual vitality, to attend what was promised because those who have faith are saved in the past. Those who have faith now will continue to be saved. That's the cause. The final warning indeed falls under Hebrews chapter 12, verse, verses 18 to 29. It reminds of Sinai's experience with a fearsome Tufani language. In fact, if those who reject the message proclaim on earth face wrath, 
how much more so will those who reject the heavenly voice. That's the key warning uh, the author of Hebrews remarks. After all, we can imagine that the audience of Hebrew was not in a state of death to face the wrath, but they were warned and exhorted to maintain faith in action until the end. Now comes the reflection of the message in India or South Asian context. Hebrew gives an exhortation to Jewish Christians to remain faithful to Christ since the fidelity of returning to the old covenant was of temptation or to go, uh, or to go astray from the message. No wonder returning would mean apostasy and practice the relationship with God. Further, the Christological and uh, soteriological significance has projected that Christ is superior to anyone and the high priest who sacrificed once and for all is forever. After all, the sacrifice made by Christ is said towards purifying the conscience of the believers completely, which the Levitical offerings could not make perfect the conscience. Therefore, just as how the Christian audience in Hebrews were expected to confess one's faith in Christ until the end, Christians today are encouraged, like you and me, to do the same. So here is a brief, a few passing questions, just as how it has been uh, promoted in the times of the early first century or the Hebrews audience. The first is, the Son of God, who is superior to all, who is superior to all, even became lower than the angels and placed into a basement to sacrifice the, the atonement, though the Son was God. A deep practical lesson to reflect upon can be pictured here. Can a complete sacrifice of God's will be made possible by us regardless of the situation we encounter and then we continue to do what is faithful and righteous the second question the temptation was visible for the audience of hebrews to re relapse back to the old life and reject the promise of god or to go away from the grace of god then what happens to our Christian lives now and for here and after when temptation of any nature knock our ways to break the new covenant we met or we have met? For this is reality experience in our lives, though it may be of different means. So keeping in mind the warnings that we have been uh, the five warnings that we have been listening in the talk earlier. Third question, we may be priests or others may be, yet it is only through Jesus, the high priest, the mediator, that we may enter into God's presence, into the fellowship, into the relationship, and not through the mentioned ideas or possessions, titles, and others, being faithful is crucial. Just as how the author of Hebrew has approached the audience, a moral and spiritual question can be, who is responsible for one's salvation and through whom or through what? And final small question for us to take back from this talk. While attending this webinar, what is the center of our attention while exploring the letter to the Hebrews, what is the center of our, of our attention while exploring the letter to the Hebrews or say the other session books? Postscript. Through the study of the letter to the Hebrews, it is evident that God had a plan of salvation, which the early, earliest church had also had that same conviction. God's revelation to humans 
and calls to faithfulness for it is imperative for humans to understand divine promise. When the Son of God had been called to be the high priest and sacrifice was offered, then it was complete in once and for all in the will of God. And this makes the message quite practical to access the presence of God. This does not mean that Hebrew, Hebrews is all about spiritualizing, but also performing real meaning of new covenant where we engage in reconciliation with fellow beings and build the church together. We also fail to reconcile the inner conflicts of emotion, the guilt of wrongdoings and failure to acknowledge. This would lead us to experience alienation from God, though may confess as Christians. In other words, Hebrews' message is a call to revise one's understanding and action of Christian faith and to leave those thoughts and actions which is incompatible with faith that Hebrews is presenting. As I've presented this in the light of one aspect of the literary which is the sermon aspect or the homily, I would like to invite all of us as we close this to say the benediction that is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 31. Let us receive. Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, Make you complete in everything good, so that you may do his will, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. On behalf of all of us, I sincerely express a profound gratitude to Dr. Supong Mayang Longkumar for the adventurous and outstanding presentation. You have massive creativity. Every minute and every point of your lecture was magnificent and marvelous. Let me highlight the crucial milestones from your presentation. Thank you very much indeed for unpacking authorship, audience, date, and other important sections, picking notable backgrounds. We are really thrilled to know the patristic theologians and their interpretations, especially the thoughts of Oregon. Thank you for unpacking historical and contextual interpretations, internal and external evidences. Thank you very much indeed for exploring Hebrew genre, its implications with the covenant literature, historiography, Christology, and theology. How nice to know the book of Hebrew that can be seen as a sermon that includes exemplar, conclusion, and exhortation. The way you explored the theological message of the letter to the Hebrews was excellent. The way you explored Christology in the book of Hebrews was brilliant. The way you explored soteriology in the book of Hebrews was tremendous indeed. It is profoundly fascinating to see how examples and models of faith have been inspirational, not only in biblical times, but even today. Your concluding benediction was amazing indeed. Thank you very much, Dr. Supong Mayan Longkumar, for your amazing presentation. Now I give this time to the audience. Before you raise your question, let me give a few seconds of instruction as usual. Your question should focus on the topic. Your question should be precise. Your question should be inclusive. Over to the audience.
you can raise your hand or you can click the reaction symbol so that we will give you a chance to raise your question. MJ Joseph. Yes. Thank you very much for your brilliant exposition. I would like to ask you a very simple question. Based on Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Can we include the rishis of India and the religious revelations in other cultures and religions of the world? Very often we confine the interpretation to the Old Testament prophets and therefore when we talk about the economy of salvation, we cannot simply limit it to uh, the Old Testament books, but to all the cultures and how God in his mercy has revealed it finally in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we should have a very holistic approach to people of other faiths and cultures. Just for a comment. Moderator, do I need to respond now or should I wait? Yes, please, Dr. Supongo. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. MJ Joseph, for the, uh, the prelim question. And in fact, you have already answered to the question that uh, you were raising within that, uh, that statement. Um, because when, we, when the exposition was taking place, uh, it, the, uh, the, the, uh, the aspect that was trying to introduce about the son, especially reveal, and God revealing himself in the beginning of the letter itself. So that shows a similarity with, uh, uh, with the Genesis account and also, also with the, the, the John, where God revealing himself, which doesn't come in most of the writings of the books. So this is an example that takes place where the ancestors or say the Old Testament prophets, how they have been speaking with, um, how God has revealed to them um, in, in different forms and means and contexts and so on. So also, as you rightly have uh, pressed the button, um, where I should say it is a green button, where we can um, definitely, uh, in our context, when we relate to this for our context, Definitely, that is the point where, uh, starting from the uh, Saint Thomas, uh, the or the earliest uh, missionaries, evangelists, and you know the, the activities of God's servants, all of these activities who have based on the revelation or based on the gospel of Jesus, definitely is talking about this itself. So that is my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Supong. The next two question from Stephen Glanroth. He <clears throat> publicly, let me read this in public chat. If we do not know who the author of this letter is, then why included in the canon of scripture? Uh, let me just quickly respond to this. Thank you for the wonderful question again. And as I've noted in the beginning, uh, it's not only about the authorship. Uh, we don't know the destination. We don't know uh, the date itself and from where the author has composed. So these are uh, lots of uh, wrestles that continue to move on, uh, but we continue to cling on with the, the quotations of Oregon, which I've already noted on. Only God knows certain, uh, certainly about this. However, we need to also ask a simple question, reflecting on the Hebrews that we have been dealing this evening, especially we have to remember um, the testimonies that has come to them. It is not that they themselves receive directly from Christ, but it was heard through the earlier uh, apostles and preachers and so on. So also, definitely when the early church fathers have, uh, when canonization took place, when they have that conviction of putting into the canon, 
definitely then they are they have also experienced way beyond than what we can imagine today so as such this is what i can also conclude into the point uh, of saying that uh, definitely it is indeed the will of god that this that should come and there are also definitely as i've mentioned about uh, priscilla a woman who could have been written this some says about Parnabas and so many other uh, theories however when this is related to the uh, the to other texts like uh, the uh, re reflecting to the themes and the ideas and so on this is more like a track a track that has been given uh, to be circulated among the uh, the persecuted christians or those who are in torment so that is the point where we find that that reality experiences uh, the message which the canonized uh, canonizers have thrown all these leads into the conclusion into that so i think we have to ask uh, those people who have canonized the new testament and put this into uh, this format because we are in this generation interpreting with the light of um, the of this aspect what we can throw from the faith and uh, through the spirit on this aspect thank you thank you sir thank you uh, sir mehboob please unmute and raise your question please uh, can you hear me now yes please yes okay so long kumar i wonder if you could comment on um this do you think the uh, the armenian position finds this strongest support in the, the letter to the hebrews given the the repeated uh exhortation warnings on relapse and moving away from the grace of god yes in tito uh, thank you uh, reverend uh, mahu Ma i'm sorry if i mispronounce on that um yes armenian uh, concepts on this uh, definitely uh, we, when we look from the reformation point of view we will find that uh, especially um from the reformation point of view john wesley you know the the uh, the followers of the armenian uh, uh, the the concepts looking from that point of view i think definitely um, there is always um, a concept of eschatological notion that is taking place in uh, while receiving uh, the the gospel or um, the hebrew uh, hebrew itself uh, gives a clarity that that that, that message Uh, they were in the end times, for example. So these concepts, the eschatological moments are always um, a pressure or a very um, a strong team um, where they continue to push forward the idea of these, uh, the warnings, and then you have to do this. Because in the, in the uh, first century, we find that uh, even Paul himself believed that uh, Jesus will return um, when he was alive. So also the early apostles or even the early fathers and so on. So even today for us, we also think that Jesus is going to come when we are still alive. So that is the point where it keeps us that we should not track away or move away uh, from the um, from the faith or the, the promise of God so that we may enter into the rest, which I'm talking about into the holy sanctuary, which there was a question on that as well. That's why... So that is the point where we find that warnings and all this always has an importance in um, the teachings, both from that aspect which you have drawn as well as for the Hebrews as well, uh, because there was an urgency of people not to uh, to be diverted from the faith, but to be, uh, to grow in maturity, and then to go uh, to go from you know faith to faith. And that is the point where, um, uh, in times of all these uh, difficulties, uh, Hebrew seeing the need that they have already experienced persecution. So also any time persecution may come. And then if we fail, then what is the point of Jesus being sacrificed after testing the grace of God or after testing the divine, divine uh, knowledge? So that is the point that Hebrew was trying to argue Uh, bring into the picture. That's why we have all this a very systematic way of um, giving giving the the Christological and soteriological aspect, and then exhorts, and then gives warning, and then exhorts. You know that kind of a literary uh, structure that we find here. 
which is more related to the Armenian, as you said, the literature system that we talk about. Dr. Supong Mayang, another question from public chat box by Ashok Jagityani. What does it mean, it mean by uh, enter into the rest in the book of Hebrews? Yeah, while I was discussing about the uh, just now, I was discussing, uh, I was dealing about this aspect when it talks about the entering into the rest. Uh, when we talk about, it's a metaphorical aspect. Um, so this is, <clears throat> this can be interpreted in two ways. In a sense that, um, in a sense that the entry into the rest is about Je uh, Jesus exemplary of entering into uh, into, into the sacrifice and then into the life that come, comes alive. But the more uh, dominant thing of understanding about entering the rest is about God also do rest on the seventh day. That means about the, uh, the, the Sabbath rest. So in this point of view, when Hebrew was uh, trying to give importance on this, he was talking about that the grace is not going to sustain again and again so that is the point where we need to be faithful, to have faith, to grow in conviction with, uh, with God. And that is the point where don't let the grace go away. Though, though we talk about in Paul, lots of things about that grace is sufficient and also so forth. But the point in Hebrew is talking about that he, the author can see that the audience may be easily drifted away or may be easily fall apart from the gospel. And that is the point where that do not let that day come when God will also rest. When the, which means when God calls out name or when, uh, when the end times comes, when we talk about the new, uh, the new, new Jerusalem and aspect in chapter 12, 13 and all this, we connect with that apocalyptic notions. So that is the point uh, what uh, Hebrew was trying to uh, employ the meaning of this God's, uh, the Sabbath race relating to the Old Testament and then relating to the God's rest as well. Yeah. And this question from Samuel Sunit, son of God compared to angel. What does <coughs> angel mean in the book of Hebrews? Now, when, when we talk about angel and uh, God, uh, the son, one thing um, in, the, in the presentation also, it has been mentioned that uh, humans are lesser than uh, the angels, which means humans were created later on and, so, and then were met lesser. But when the glory takes place, they are honored and the glory is being put up. Whereas the superiority over angels, as we suggest, if we look into this aspect, then we will find that in chapter Hebrews chapter one verse fourteen, the talks about that uh, that clarifies that angels are merely ministering spirits. Angels are merely ministering spirits, and the Son is eternal, which we find in chapter uh, one verse eight through thirteen. So this is um, the, the author wanted to portray that the superiority over angels is to suggest that the readers were strayed from the original teachings, like um, the Jewish Christian uh, sectarian groups like Ebonites who believe that, who believe in the angelic Christology, for example, and then they make that angel uh, Jesus is also an angel. So that kind of a uh, sectarian community's teaching have uh, also influenced uh, the context. And that is the point where uh, Hebrew is trying to uh, saying that the uh, angels are merely ministering spirits and that Jesus is eternal. Uh, we also have a New Testament scholar serving as a Deputy Director of Ecumenical Christian Center. He has a question. Go to Mr. Tang Mindrun Wepe. Go to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mayang, for the very insightful lectures you are giving us this evening. Yes, as you have uh, been uh, mentioned and highlighted in your presentations, the 
priesthood of, priesthood of Christ is very much prominent in the letters to the Hebrews, where uh, even in the uh, reflections, you have mentioned only through Jesus, the high priest, the mediator, that we may enter God's presence. However, when we see uh, our religious, social, religious, social and religious context, especially uh, India, even other people of other faith, they <clears throat> would say they are very much uh, going deep into spirituality, experiencing the creator. So how, I mean, the, do we reconcile claiming only through Jesus we could attain salvation or experiencing God? And what about <clears throat> the experiences that other people and people of other faith, ex, I mean, experience? How do we reconcile or what's your comment on that? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Millen, for the adding a very, uh, a very testing question. Um, because as we as we are as questioned by uh, being noted in the earlier part of the question that we are living in a multi-religious, multi, uh, multi faith and multicultural, socio-political context, and then everyone claims that. Yes, this is true. This is true. Ours is right. Ours is right. And at the end, we say that, yes, there's only one God. Then whom are we following today? So that is the point that we try to make. But I want to comment on this from a personal point of view, not from other point of view on this. Because, because for me, this is a conviction. And for me, that should follow, that should come first rather than the, the knowledge or the exposition that are taking place on this. So basing on this, <clears throat> when it's, it talks about Hebrew, saying that he is, uh, that Jesus is the high priest, and then it has been made once and for all, <clears throat> which we all uh, know already from the Old Testament, uh, the Levitical uh, aspect that uh, those people who offered, gone, uh, we never know being human continue to sin or they were in the sin and then they came. But Jesus being perfect, being holy. So in that case, he became the right person to sacrifice because according to the Melchizedek order, order of the Melchizedek priesthood, only one person can do that. And that offering can take place by one person and that should be forever. And so in that line of thought, definitely it is Jesus who have you know, come into the picture and then related on this. And that is the point where he proved clearly justifies and then supports the view that, yes, it is Jesus, the son of God, who is God, is the one who has sacrificed himself with his, you know, by abasement and by his blood. And that is where it was for once and for all this has been cleared and there's no more sacrifice anymore. So that is the point that, uh, from that point of view, let me come to the conviction of uh, what I can, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a follower of Christ in this aspect, because if a Christ who has sacrificed for us, died for us, and at the same time, the biggest thing is resurrected for us, and is alive, people have witnessed on that. Is it not that more powerful, more uh, convincing, then those gods who lived on earth help others, encouraged, motivated, they died, but they never resurrected. So the resurrection concept, um, the resurrection aspect of this conviction makes uh, Christ as God. And then that sacrifice is once and then for all. And definitely in a pluralistic context like this today, definitely we may be we may be diverted and tested with all this knowledge, with all these humanitarian aspects and so on. Yes, we need to balance all those things because we're living in a society, we are all human, we have minds. However, the bottom line is just like the Hebrew said, on the, on the day to come, to enter into the rest or behind the curtain, just as Jesus went, if 
we miss out. Then the, the anger that comes, you know, the warnings that has come, that will fall on us. So if we, and that is also taken only through faith. Christ himself proved with faith and being faithful, so also with us. And that is the point where um, we are being reminded about Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that is the key point of uh, relating the Christological and soteriological aspect with our conviction. And in a pluralistic context like, like the world today, I think at the end of the day, whether I am a priest or not, as I say, whether I am a missionary or not, whether I'm a lay person or not, at the end of the day, we believe in God. And then which God is going to give you salvation? That is the question that is there in the reflection. And I want all of us to ponder on that again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Supong Mayan. We'll go to the final short question by <laughs> Ma'am Janie Miriam James. Please explain about uh, the better resurrection in chapter 1135. Now this is, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, <clears throat> and thank you, ma'am, for this uh, another uh, brainstorming uh, question, uh, which, in fact, interpretation may not suffice to complete this, because unless we humans have experienced the resurrection, I don't think it will be uh, difficult for us to explain that resurrected or resurrection aspect except taking the example of Christ. So as in chapter 11, verse 30, uh, in 11, verse 35, as it clearly mentions, women received their death by resurrection, others by torture, refusing to accept release in order to obtain better resurrection. So in this case, which is related to the Old Testament uh, explanations about the um, the, the Exodus event that we will relate with, because the the place of how they move on from uh, from from that torment or from that um, place uh, in the hands of Egyptians, and then on the way there were temptations and so on that was taking place. So in the midst of this, the question remains: which resurrection is going to be better? So this is more or less like administrating to the justice in relation to the faith that we uh, talk about, except that the wrath of God should not come or else it is not about that this or that aspect of resurrection is better or than this or that. If we look closely into the text, I think uh, we can obtain better uh, meanings again, if we look into this, not about the gender issues or not about the class or the time and period or such, but the bottom line is as said, um, I think, the resurrection aspect we cannot comprehend at this point of time when we are alive unless we experience resurrection uh, in a true sense what jesus has given as an example so that is uh, my response for now thank you thank you very much dr supong mayang longkuma before i give this time to professor johnson thomas putty sir for the announcements as well as a question for the next week I sincerely thank Dr. Supong Mayang Longkumar for the fantastic and creative presentation. You have won our hearts. You are genius. As a sign of respect, shall we all raise our hands and thank Dr. Supong Mayang Longkumar for an amazing... I'm humbled. Thank I'm you. humbled. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Professor Dr. Johnson Thomas Kuti, sir. So friends, uh, it was a wonderful time for us uh, being together to learn the 19th lecture that is based on the letter to the Hebrews and uh, the ECC CSI wider contextualized biblical hermeneutics created a wider wave around the world that many started to show interest in studying the New Testament very systematically, profoundly theologically and missionologically. So that is a great success of this program. And you see that uh, Dr. Supong Mayang was giving us a wonderful and very profound 
uh, interpretation of the letter to the Hebrews. And whenever I think about the letter to the Hebrews, I always think about the pre-existent uh, Christology. So alongside of the Gospel of John chapter 1, 1 to 18, and also the letter to the Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 20, the letter to the Hebrews chapter 1, 1 to 4, do a good background for a pre-existent Christology. So other than that, whenever I teach my students, I always, I am always fascinated about the alliteration that is used in the first verse of the letter to the Hebrews, that is, Polumeros, Polutropos, uh, Palai, uh, Patrasin, and a Prophetize. Is that the five words begin with the same letter, I? So is that, that makes an alliteration. That alliteration, that style is never sustained in any of the English translations or any of the regional translations. So that makes this letter a fascinating one. As Dr. Mayan was giving us the inception and the picking notable backgrounds about authorship, date, audience, literacy. And also he was giving us a wonderful array of details about the theological message of the letter to the Hebrews and the reflecting the message. And he was bringing the significance of this letter to the contemporary context. And also finally, he gave a postscript, a very good epilogue. In that way, okay, he was giving us a well-detailed, well-described and fascinating, okay, uh, interpretation of the letter to the Hebrews. And I am very happy that Supong Maya as a young man is coming up. Okay, as a wonderful scholar. So we are going to expect more from you in the coming days. So you can do that. Okay. Though he is an expert in the book of Revelation and he had shown okay so much bravery to okay do a strange book like the letter to the Hebrews. So we appreciate you for that. And uh, when we think about uh, the next week, the next week we are going to have the 20th lecture. Okay. The 20th lecture is going to be on the message of the general epistles, the seven epistles. So that is going to be a Herculean or Himalayan task. That is going to be done by one of the best known New Testament scholars from India. That is none other than Nyanavaram, Dr. Reverend Dr. Nyanavaram Mazilamani. And we are going to hear from him in the next week. And let us eagerly wait for what he has for us. And uh, today we were having more than 100 people attending this session. That was a great encouragement for us. And uh, the question for next week, sorry, the assignment for next week is, is that uh, it is all about the right in 300 words about the superiority of Jesus in the letter to the Hebrews and its interpretative significance and challenges in the contemporary context. Okay, let me repeat that. The superiority of Jesus in the letter to the Hebrews and its interpretative significance, and at the same time, interpretative challenges, okay, in the contemporary context that you have to write within 300 words. So be very careful and very calculative. So thank you so much. May God bless us, and we will see you next week. Over to Ramakrishna Sumba. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Johnson Thomas Kutisar, for the announcements and assignment question.